Welcome back. Let's talk now about your unconscious or implicit memories. There's generally three categories of implicit memories, and those are memories of procedures, that is how to do things. Uh, priming is a, um, well, you'll see. And uh, conditioning, good old classical conditioning, especially as it relates to emotions. So we're going to talk about each of these different types of memory in turn. So let's talk about procedural memory. Maybe you've heard the phrase muscle memory. That's procedural memory, learning how to do things. Um, so for example, you may have a motor memory of how to tie your shoe or how to ride a bicycle um, or how to perform a particular dance move. Um, but if you try to explain how you do those things to other people, it turns out to be really hard, right? Try teaching someone just by using words how to tie their shoes. Good luck with that, right? What do people usually have to do? It's like, sit down and watch me tie my shoes and then I'll figure it out. Or um, has anybody ever asked you for directions and you try to give the directions and you realize I can't communicate this really well with words and you just say, oh, just follow me, I'll take you there. Right? That's an example of a procedural memory. Um, one thing that's really interesting about procedural memories, and I'm going to take a little detour here, but it's relevant, uh, is that for people who have dementia, Alzheimer's disease is the type of dementia that most people know best, um, people with dementia hang on to their procedural memories the longest. Let me show you. So dementia just means a, a loss of uh, cognitive information. And there's many different types. Um, there's something called vascular dementia, where um, it's problems with the blood vessels that ultimately cause dementia. Um, the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Um, and Alzheimer's destroys the connections between neurons, um, and it destroys the neurons, and it really compromises comp cognitive abilities in general, but it hits memory particularly hard. And it's usually diagnosed in people over the age of 65. And I've got a picture here of, on the left side, you can see a cartoon of a healthy brain. And on the right, actually, that's a photograph of a healthy human brain cut this way. And on the right side is a photograph of uh, a hemisphere of a human brain in someone who had severe Alzheimer's disease. and you know, the loss of neurons in Alzheimer's disease is obvious. Well, it turns out in Alzheimer's disease, different types of memory last uh, different amounts of time. So for example, the first type of memory to be impacted or compromised by Alzheimer's disease is short-term memory. How does that come up? You'll see someone who starts a sentence, it's very clear what they want to talk about, they obviously know what they want to say in the sentence. They start the sentence, but by the time they get about halfway through the sentence, especially if it's a long sentence, they can't remember what it was they wanted to say in that sentence. Now that happens naturally during aging, but it's a dramatic change in Alzheimer's disease. Um, after some loss of your ability to remember information from the short term, um, the next hit comes to autobiographical movies or movies, autobiographical memories, um, that is episodic memories. So you lose that information. Um, one of the things that's really difficult about having a loved one with Alzheimer's disease is when you get to the point where they don't recognize you anymore, where they think you're someone else in the family. So their um, episodic memories of you are being lost. For a while, they can compensate for that with their remaining semantic memory. It's like, oh, you're my daughter. Okay, or that fact, right? But then eventually, um, memory for semantic memory, facts, um, also uh, becomes lost. But procedural memories, memories for how to do things, hang in there. Um, and you may remember from our, my first lecture, I talked about some nursing homes uh, in Europe where they're trying to design the nursing homes 
to take advantage of uh, retained procedural knowledge so that people can live uh, happier, more fulfilling lives with whatever memories, systems they still have left. So if you know how to get up and make your bed, well then do it, right? If you know how to you know, walk down the hallway and have a cup of coffee in a cafe because you did that for um, you know, the last 10 years of your life before you got dementia, well, do it in the nursing home. Okay, uh, what I want to talk about next is conditioning or conditioned memories. And it could be either classical conditioning or operant conditioning. And remember that classical conditioning is learning to associate two stimuli or learning to associate a stimulus with a particular response, um, usually a feeling, uh, versus operant conditioning, which is learning to associate your actions with the repercussions of your actions. And you'll remember um, the John B. Watson demonstration with little Albert, where he taught little Albert to be afraid of fuzzy things. Have you ever had an experience where you meet somebody and you really like them right off the bat? Or you meet someone and the little hairs on the back of your neck stick up, you just, don't want anything to do with them. They're very, they make like, oh, that person is creepy. I'm staying away. Now, you really don't have the information that you need to make that decision. You just met them. How do you know? Maybe the person you really like is a psychopath and the person that you uh, had an immediate allergic reaction to is actually the nicest person in the world. How, where does that come from? Well, it comes from conditioning. Usually the person you like reminds you or has characteristics that are like someone um, uh, that you've liked previously in your life. And it's often the case that someone you dislike reminds you of or triggers, has characteristics that trigger your feelings about that uh, bad, evil person from the past. But the interesting thing about these sort of reactions is A, we're typically not aware of them. We think it's something about the person rather than something about our perception of the per person. So we're not terribly aware of them. The self-awareness is not there. And the second one is that we don't know where they came from, right? So a lot of people have fears and phobia, phobias, but they can't really tell you where those fears or reactions came from. Hence, implicit memory. Okay, the last type of implicit memory I'm going to cover in this section is priming. And priming is when your exposure to something in the past changes your reaction to something in the present. And before I say too much about it, I'm going to show you a silent one minute long video that demonstrates priming. And you really want to do what this video asks you to do because then you'll understand priming and remember it without trouble. So watch this video on priming and it's silent. So did it work? I'm sure it worked. Yeah, priming works like a charm. Um, so just to reiterate, 
Um, if you wanted to measure priming, you might do something like ask participants to read a word, let's say the word soap. Something happens before they read that word. Um, either it's a prime or it doesn't prime it. So for example, if I show you a pineapple and then ask you to read the word soap, there's really no relationship between pineapples and soap that I'm aware of. So that would give you a baseline measure of how long it takes to read the word soap. Compare that to people, you showed them a picture of a shower and then you ask them to read the word soap. Those people will read the word soap more quickly. They will recognize the word soap more quickly because you've just primed them with something related to soap that is namely a shower. Now, I said that priming works great. Anytime something works really well, you can be you can rest assured that large corporations are going to take advantage of it to help sell you things. Um, and here are a, a number of ads that demonstrate priming in any number of ways. So FedEx, right, has that big white arrow in the middle of the name to imply movement. Most people don't aren't consciously aware of the white triangle, but they're probably still influenced by it. Uh, Baskin Robbins ice cream. I haven't been in a Baskin Robbins ice cream in, God, 30 years, but I know they have 31 flavors of ice cream. I'm like, how do I know that bizarre random fact? Because it's right in the name. All the signs for Baskin Robbins ice cream, look at the pink letters. What do they spell? Or the pink line segments. They spell the number 31. Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors. That's why we, rem we remember. Um, Amazon wants you to remember that they have everything from A to Z, so they draw a line from A to Z. Tostitos Chips wants to promote the idea of uh, gatherings and groups, so the, a couple of the letters in the word Tostitos is transformed into pictures of people at a party, right? Uh, Michelob Ultra Beer um, you know, boring old beer. It's, it's, I think it's one of those low calorie beers, so it probably doesn't have a lot of flavor. How do you sell a bland beer? Well, you try to get people to associate it with uh, athleticism, having a good time, and sexy people, right? Implicit associations. All right, so those are some examples of priming as used by corporations. Um, and I'm just going to reiterate that priming occurs whenever a related previous experience or a previous experience is related to a stimulus that you're judging now. So if I show you a, um, a photograph of Marilyn Monroe and then a, a color photograph of Marilyn Monroe, I don't know, maybe before an experiment and during the experiment, I ask you to tell me who that woman is, you'll be able to recognize Marilyn Monroe there much more quickly than if instead of seeing Marilyn e earlier, you had seen Ronald McDonald, okay? So changes in reaction time, changes in accuracy are commonly used to measure priming because you sort of have to use an unconscious measure. So reaction time, uh, accuracy, fill in the blanks, these are all word stem completion, these are all things that um, scientists use to measure priming. And I'm going to give you one last example of implicit memory and see if you've ever had this experience. It happens to me maybe once or twice a year. It's a kind of implicit memory called repetition priming, but all priming involves repetition, so let's just say it's priming. Let's say I'm studying for the GREs and I learn a new word, plethora or plethora, plethora, which means just a lot of stuff, right? So I learn that word and then I go about my day and I must hear that word two or three times. It's like, how weird is that? I just learned that word for the first time this morning and now I've heard it twice in one day. I've never heard that word before in my life. Actually, you have, you just didn't know it, so you didn't pay attention to it. But learning the word this morning makes it easier for you to recognize other people using that word later in the day. 
Maybe you bought a particular t-shirt or a particular pair of tennis shoes that you thought were really unique. You put them on, you go about your day and you realize, oh my God, there's a guy on the bus with the same shoes or there's two people on campus with the same shoes. I've never seen these shoes before. That's a kind of priming. Your experience with your own shoes changes the way you see the rest of the world. It really does. I drive a little uh, Mini Cooper car, and when I bought mine, I was shocked at how many Mini Coopers were on the road all of a sudden. They weren't. It was just my experience with a Mini Cooper car changed my perception of the world, right? It primed me to see all the other Mini Cooper cars in the world. They were there before. The only thing that changed is my experience. Okay. I'm gonna leave implicit memory right there, at least our introduction to it, and come back to hear all about some fascinating cases of amnesia.